Hello, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. I've been a fan of Gail Collins' New York Times opinion columns for years. I was particularly happy when she returned for being the first female editor of the editorial page of the New York Times, a dream position for many, to again be a columnist for that paper's opinion pages, where she provides lively, humorous, and provocative takes on the absurdity of much of modern American political life. I recently read her book, When Everything Changed, which documents the changing role of women in U.S. society between 1960 and today. It's astonishing how far things have come and also how backward things were even a generation ago. Our discussion moved beyond the ideas in that book to her personal interest in journalism and also to the state of journalism today, as well as the future of print journalism and its fight against a world of fake news on the Internet. It was a charming, insightful, and illuminating discussion that was a highlight as we visited the very busy New York Times building on a day a particularly significant news story broke. Patreon subscribers can find the full video of this program and all our programs the day they appear at patreon.com slash origins podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Well, Gail, thanks for welcoming us to the New York Times. <laughs> and pleasure. Uh, as I told you before, I love waking up with you in the morning, at least uh, metaphorically. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, look, since this is sort of an origins podcast, I want to talk about your origins. Mm-hmm. Did you always want to be a journalist? Pretty much. Uh, my mother really had this vision that she wanted to be a journalist. and she. I mean, she was the war. She, you know, yeah. had to drop out of college and all that. But, but I think so. Once I did a little teeny bit of it, she, she this, jumped this on it. Great. Oh, and, and 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 in spite of that, you still wanted to do it. <laughs> I did. Yeah. <laughs> did she went? To, did both your parents sort of at least start college, or they both were they college ed- educated? Yeah, my father was an engineer. Okay. And my mother went to college, but had to drop out after her first year. Yeah. So, as, as, but she as, was very ambitious about education for all the kids. We'll get to that. It's interesting. Did the fact that your mother dropped out of the first year affect your view of sort of women's roles in the work world? Which, because I want to talk about that. During. No, I don't. Not sure that I had any particular view of women. I mean, you know, when you're a kid, I, yeah. I just saw teachers, and they were all women. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's <laughs> Everybody right. Everybody was a woman. Yeah. Um, and my mother was just wildly ambitious for us, so um, there was never any thought about, well, you can't do that because you're a girl. Well, okay. Well, that's good. And so, you you went to journalism school, and and you grew up in in, in Ohio, which which I still live in. But your first job was in Connecticut. Oh uh, well, I, I went to when I went to journalism school, and then I, um, which is not, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that as an undergraduate yeah. degree yeah. if anybody's thinking about it in the world. It was just. It was the only thing that nobody offered as a major in Cincinnati, so I oh. would have to go away to school uh, if I majored in journalism. So I wanted to go away, so I majored in journalism. But then I got a master's degree in political science yeah. okay. at the University of Massachusetts. So we were in Amherst then, and I got married in Amherst, and we, I worked there for a little paper in Amherst for a while. And then um, my husband got a job in Connecticut, and then we went down there. Oh, that's there. why you went do you think there's an ideal uh, um, major for for would be journalists? <laughs> <laughs> no, whatever you know, rows your boat because yeah. you know th- th- figuring out how to write about it is something that I think you do more after you figure out sure. what it is you want to write. Yeah, and I've even said as a scientist that that I've sort of learned more a lot more after my PhD than than before. What do you think? Of, uh, well, I'm all over the map here, but my feeling when i when i think about journalists in particular for science which is my area that it i i think it's almost better to have for journalists not to be an expert in that area because the uh, the role partly the role of a journalist of course is to report the news but 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 to translate that to people and and by if you're not an expert in it um then at least you, you then you have to think from the point of view of the people who who don't know the jargon and and, and everything else that's true, but there are certainly tons of people in my business who know so much about the thing they're covering that 
um, that, that it, it's you know they're as if they've had, they've gotten advanced degrees in it, but uh, they're still able to also take it back and write about it. So you did you did a master's degree in political science or government? Government, I think they called it back then. So is that was that is that <laughs> yeah back then is that is that still your prime interest? Do you think? I mean, yeah, that's sort of always what I've done. I wrote my um, my master's thesis on the student power movement and um, ah. And compared to the two schools that I had been to mm-hmm. when that was going on and why they were different. But, um, and then, yeah, uh, I just, you know, I spent, when I was in Connecticut, because I couldn't get a job in Connecticut, mm-hmm. I started a news service in Connecticut and I went to all these little papers and said, I will cover your state legislators for $10 uh, a week or something. It was I ridiculous. was wondering how yeah. you started a news service. So it was really yeah. just a necessity was the mother yeah, invention. Yeah, yeah. I, I started a little paper and then they went bankrupt. So then I just was sort of wandering around. And um, so I, I mean, by the end, we had like 35 client papers. We were really covering the field when it came to the state legislature. And I was so obsessed with the Connecticut state legislature. <laughs> I mean, I knew every single person there. I covered every debate. I just, I, it, it, it's pathetic the amount that I knew about the <laughs> Connecticut state legislature. But I just so got into it then, the whole political scene sure, there, sure. that that just translated into everything else that I did. Uh, one of your quotes, which I think sets the framework, uh, a quote from one, one, your your book, uh, "When Everything Changed." When everything changed, which was fascinating read. I mean, having grown up in that period and being not so aware of some of the statistics, I found it remarkable. But one one quote from it seemed to summarize for me the whole book, which was, "When history opened up to American women in the late twentieth century, it did not offer them perfect bliss. It gave them the opportunity to face the dark moments." on their own terms, and to exalt in the spaces between. I found that a wonderful quote. Thank you. Uh, and what's surprising, I think, what may be surprising, and I think it's worthwhile since a lot of people listening are, are, are probably younger, uh, to realize how dramatically different things were in the 1960s, which which I tend to think, even the early 60s, which you tend to think of as a, as a free and open time. But for women, um, one gets a sense that more women sort of have gone into the workplace since then. But you point out in, that in 1960, as many women were working, um, as were working during the peak of World War II, the difference was that most got married and then stopped working. Okay? Yes. Uh, and women were barred from, from flying planes. The 1961, I love this quote. This, there was, the medical school dean had a quota, and I want to talk to you about quotas, that um, we have a small quota. We do keep women out when we can. We don't want them here two per class. I get the sense that your own personal experience isn't reflected in, in, that, in, that, in, the, in the statistics that you provide in terms of women in general. No, and I think that's, that's a piece of the whole thing. You have uh-huh. the amazing thing, I just have to say this one thing, because this is what drives me just whenever I'm talking about this stuff. Uh-huh. I, had, I wrote a book about the millennium, and mm-hmm. I, someone at the Times asked me to do a piece on women over the last thousand years. Oh, okay. Uh, for the big millennium issue mm-hmm. of the magazine. And um, so I, I said, okay, sure. And he said, I just want to say, I think this is a win. <laughs> and when I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought that the way civilization basically looked at women's role in life mm-hmm. in the Western civilization changed in my lifetime. What was going on for yeah. millennia yeah. changed in my lifetime. I got to see the whole thing happen, and that just drives me nuts. It's so exciting. Yeah, I mean, things have changed exponentially, and and uh, uh, we, I was talking to someone recently. I had pointed out that, that I hadn't thought about this. That that in some ways, um, the disparity between how things could be and how things are is bigger now than it was before, because the in the Middle Ages, of course, things were were miserable in many ways, but things changed so slowly. Right. But but now through technology and so many other things, things change so fast that the opportunities to do things often can't keep up with with the with with current events. That's true. But people just taking the opportunity to look back over the last fifty yeah. or sixty years, you think, holy moly! And it, it's because it's because of technology. Mm-hmm. It's because particularly of the economy. Yeah. Everything is always driven by the economy when yeah, you get sure. right down to mm-hmm. it. And the the great kind of transitory moment at least to me, was in the 1970s when middle-class families who had all grown up after World War II, there was this explosion of middle-classness, 
Everybody was making more money. Everybody's moving to the suburbs. Everybody, for the first time, is expecting to have a house and a family vacation, things that nobody ever anticipated before. And suddenly, in the 70s, the economy ran smack into all kinds of international problems, the oil shortage, and uh, it didn't work anymore. You could not support that family that you were used to having Mm -hmm. on one income. And so— women went to work. It wasn't like everyone sat down and said, I'm going to liberate myself and go back to work. It It was, was oh my God, we don't have enough money to pay the mortgage. You know, Susan, go, and you've got to get us something here. Well, something you point out in the book, which I thought was interesting, is that in that that heyday era when the economy was going really well, it was viewed that... uh, that part of success in the middle class, in some sense, was that women, a woman, wouldn't have to work. Of course, that, yeah. That was viewed as a status symbol. In right, some sense. and and it was it was you were sort of a failure as a husband if you couldn't provide that. Everybody is going sitting around first the first time in history you've mm-hmm. got television every mm-hmm. night. Everybody is sitting around the television and they are watching stories in which the women are housewives, and if, if it's a situation comedy, they're at home, they're taking care of the kids, dad's supporting the family, and that is the vision you've got. The only other vision you're getting a lot of is men in the West riding alone into the sunset, <laughs> but there are no women riding with the men in the sunset. They, you know, The women are in the house, and the men are supporting them, and if they don't do that, then they've screwed up the vision. You know? And that, that didn't change till the 70s, I guess, in really? terms of television, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. But, you know, one of the themes, of course, in that quote is that when when things change, uh, they don't... Uh, there was a quote which I've, which I've read recently, which I like a lot, which from Mark Twain, which said that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. It rhymes a lot. <laughs> but um, the, things have changed, but it doesn't always give you everything you want or, or, or think you want. And it, when you, in fact, when you get what you think you want, sometimes it's, it's, it's not what you really want. Now, so that there's these tensions. Going back to work... Of course, provided huge additional tensions for women. <laughs> but if there was this vision that uh, that you were a failure if you were a man and you couldn't provide your fam for your family, when suddenly that changed, that must have also provided incredible tension for men. There must have been a lot of women working, but men feeling like failures in that process. Yeah, and it was, but it, it too was a really fast flip over. Mm-hmm. I will never forget back in the I think it was in the late seventies, the early. I was at, at high school in mm-hmm. Connecticut somewhere. Mm-hmm talking about one of my books, but somehow I wound up in this class in this very, like, New Britain or somewhere, not not upper middle class, just normal, regular kids, and a whole class full of guys who are about 15, I'd say. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were being very polite, of course. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> and I said, what do you look for in a woman? Now, maybe if it was, if it was a different person asking, they would have mm-hmm. said, I want somebody who's very sexy yeah. or something. But what they all said was they wanted a good earner. Really? They're 15, and they're already figuring whoever it is they're going to marry. They want to make sure it's somebody who is going to also be a good earner. What? When? When was this? This was in the the, the I would say the late 70s, the early wow. 80s. That's fascinating. And I, I just it had never. I, I I knew men were adjusting, and you know the new younger men were were certainly much used mm. to the idea that women would work. But the idea that that was a priority when you're planning your life. You gotta have that other person in there bringing home money too. That that kind of that surprises me. I, I mean, I was in I was in I was twenty and seventy four, I guess. And yeah, it's interesting. I I I wouldn't have said that. It's I grew up in Canada, but it's slightly different. Well, wow. <laughs> that's a, that's fascinatingly different. Well, one of the things you mentioned, which I I, I um, surprised me, was uh, even in the nineteen sixties, you said social security. Uh, payments were different for women, were based differently on women's wages than men's wages? Yeah. Wow. In what, uh, what way? Well, it, it had to do, uh, uh, well, part of it had to do with women were making less money, yeah. of course. But also, if you're married, you know, if you're the husband, you're mm-hmm. getting yours plus a piece of your wife's. If you're mm-hmm. a wife, you're not getting yours mm-hmm. because the husband's making more money. Oh, so therefore, it's just it, the way they figured it all out early on was just they worked under the yeah. presumption that every family had a husband mm-hmm. and a wife, and the yeah. wife, if she was working, it was not a critical part of of the picture and the structure. So that 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 just the idea of the working wife as a, a central yeah. income maker did not really factor into it well, when they were beginning well, to think well, about this stuff. Well, we'll get to equal rights from women and civil rights. Did, was that legislated then to be different at some point? I assume it's different now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There was yeah. a bunch as they went along the way. In, and so one of the things that I also learned from from your book was that 
that the ch- the institutional changes for women were kind of intimately tied to sometimes for better or worse to the civil rights movement. Yeah. And um and maybe you could describe that a little for people uh, uh how how that worked in the in the late 60s uh, uh, and uh, up through the 70s. Well, a lot of the women who first became leaders in the women's movement started in the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. And the civil rights movement was such an amazing central story to everybody's life and thinking about it and just, first of all, envisioning that the way society is set up is not necessarily the way society ought to be and then that you're supposed to get out there and then that the heroes are the people who don't necessarily run society but who get out there and say, no, this is not right, we're going to do this, the fight for it. And all of that created the women's movement in the same way that it did the civil rights movement. And the people who were involved in the civil rights movement, who then, particularly if they were white, moved into the anti-war movement, Mm -hmm. the guys in that culture tended to be what we would now think of as really sexist. I mean, for them, Mm -hmm. the idea of sharing power with women in the movement was... You know, chicks here, chicks there. Uh A lot of talking about chicks going on at that (laughs) period in time. And it... That was part of the thing that that sprung the women's movement was that reaction to the, what the guys were doing in in the anti-war movement. So you you had all of these things happening at once: the learning to challenge mm-hmm. society, the understanding that there are profound rights that must wrongs that must be righted, and and then when you're there, suddenly, hey, this is me too. I've got a piece of this. This is you know, I'm. One one of the things when I uh, when I reflect on this and reflect on the current times when I'm when I'm trying not to be depressed and pessimistic, which <laughs> lately is frequently, uh, I I kind of hope that one of the things that's going to come out of the turmoil we're seeing in in terms of the crisis and democracy, and journalism, and what's happening in this country, and we just came from England, it, I I think that that I hope that young people are getting I don't know the word is radicalized, but but. We're seeing uh, protests, uh, 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 climate change protests. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're just in London, and the streets were closed because young people were protesting climate change. That when you get young people beginning to protest, it creates a culture where they realize that they don't need to accept the status quo, not just on the issue they're protesting, mm-hmm. but more generally. So do you think that that sort of, I was certainly around the 60s, that culture of, of young people protesting the war opened up people's minds to look at every other aspect of society. It did. and But you also had a very unique time there in, the, in that you did have all this money for a while. I mean, yeah. there was a long period there in which you just didn't worry about ever getting a job. I remember when we were graduating from college, mm-hmm. if you wanted to move to New York, mm-hmm. you could... If you had a degree, you could become a social worker because the city needed so many social workers. You could just come to New York and become a social social worker. It was like that. And there were all kinds of jobs like that that you could just simply apply to. And there it was because there was such a need in a growing society, in an economically booming society for people to do stuff. And if you come out into that kind of thing, you have a different sense of confidence than other people other generations do about what you can do, what you can get away with. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And it's very, very liberating. Um, and I, I don't know that there'll ever be a period exactly like that in which you can just go on for so long on, you know, just on the economy, just kind of ride and glide along. I hate, I, I personally like never to pr- predict the future less than two billion years in the future because it's a lot easier. <laughs> but, but if I asked you to predict the future, can you, do you think there'll be a time in the next... 40 years when when children will be better off than their parents when a, when a, when a generation will be better off than a generation before as clearly happened sort of in the 50s or 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 and and maybe 60s hard to believe i mean clearly people will have that expectation yeah, for the kids always. and some kids it'll work out for and some kids it won't but that idea that it almost automatically happens i think we just had that one moment and may not ever come back again. Well, okay, let's go back to the 60s. One thing that I didn't realize was that the sort of the Equal Rights Amendment came out of uh, not quite an afterthought, but but uh, again, out of out of trying to create this, this the civil rights uh, legislation, mm-hmm. and and it was kind of tacked on reluctantly or with hope that it would. By being tacked on, it would stop the civil rights legislation itself, and I, it, that that political dynamic yeah. was interesting to me. I, it, so again, there's a certain disagreement among 
historians about exactly how that all worked out. And one of the sagas, which I tend to use because it's the most fun and romantic, yeah. but is that you had the Civil Rights Act going through and you had Southern senators who really wanted to stop it. Yeah. And they did everything they possibly could. And one of the things they did, either as a joke or as an attempt to just make mm -hmm. another thing that would sidetrack yeah. the whole thing, was they threw women on there. Equal opportunity from women in employment. Yeah. yeah. And and then suddenly a few women, women like Margaret Chase Smith, thought, whoa, let's grab this baby and run with it. And it was in the bill. It was in the bill as it was finally passed. And nobody thought about it at all. And then suddenly the next day, when the uh, when the federal government opens its equal employment opportunity yeah, yeah. centers, the first people in the door are stewardesses. Yeah, nobody had thought yeah. about the stewardesses. They'd had terrible lives. I mean, they were totally regulated. They had they had to be checked every day, measured and For weighed. Weight, yeah. Yes, and and they had to wear the same stuff, and they had to be incredibly polite and light the cigarettes of all of their male <laughs> passengers and all this other stuff, and it drove them crazy. And they couldn't be. They could not move up. There was no place to move. You were going to be a stewardess and stay there. And then when you were 35, you had to retire because nobody wanted an old stewardess on yeah, the plane. It yeah. would depress the businessmen. And if you were married, you had right. to quit, didn't you? Didn't some of them yeah. have to hide the right. fact that they were married? Oh, yeah, married? they pretended they weren't married. There was a lot of that going on, too. I mean, it was just, it was absolutely in, insane. And and one of the the members of Congress who was listening to this, when and they when the, the airline people were trying to explain about how important it was that businessmen be allowed to see attractive young women when they get yeah. on the plane, said, are you running an airline or a whorehouse there, yeah. sir? You know, yeah. What the hell? Yeah, that was a great line. It was. And 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 so it, it just happened. And in my paper, I found when I was you know doing research, mm -hmm. ran an editorial making fun of it saying, ho, ho, now I guess the Playboy bunnies will all have yeah. to be men wearing hairy legs or something like that yeah. along that line. I mean, just it was just not taken seriously as a big deal until women started filing suits. And yeah. they were very normal women. It wasn't yeah. like, you know, Gloria Stein yeah, ran yeah. up and, and filed a suit. It was regular people working for the phone company in Alabama and stuff like that who had to help support their families for whom it was really important to be able sure. to make more money to be promoted to have those opportunities started filing suits. And uh, it just took off and it changed everything. It's with, it was an afterthought. So people, when this yeah. legislation was in, it was just sort of tacked on, oh, again, to yeah. try and stop the legislation, right. but it ended up being there. And people hadn't really seriously thought through the implication of the legislation. No, no. I mean, certainly men hadn't. I mean, there were a few women, obviously, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. who knew what was going on there, but well, it was not a central thought at all. One of the things that also surprised, surprised me, given a sort of current times, or at least my history in, in the United States, is that the Democrats opposed, particularly opposed the equal rights and equal rights amendment because they thought it would get rid of special protections that they tried to put in to protect women. And, right. And so, again, maybe you could talk about that. Well, again. deeply ironic. But the, one of the things, you know, that you had women who were working, uh, especially during the war, you mm -hmm. know, working triple shifts and all this other stuff. And they were working in very difficult jobs, some of them, you know, very dangerous jobs and some of them very inappropriate jobs for, you know, people who didn't have the physical capacity to lift large amounts of things. Yeah. And there were, it wasn't a central issue in the history of the world, but there was stuff like that. And there were certainly a lot of places where, you, women wanted more protections. They wanted, you know, better hours. They wanted all kinds of things. And you could sell those things much more easily as it's important for the moms out there rather than as some great cosmic equal rights thought. So there was a lot of protective legislation for women that, you know, they worried, you know, they'd lose. You know, special yeah, hours that sure. you, you know, and stuff and, like and that. And so they oppose. They were the party opposing it more. Yeah. Well, yeah. Nobody was thrilled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it, you know, it happened. And when, when once it happened, once it just started going, you could not. Congress was passing stuff for women so fast in the early seventies. It was just like a blizzard, a tornado of new legislation for women. Uh, and then, uh, uh, of course, the, the Equal Rights Act came through, and it was a blizzard again, and then suddenly everything stopped. Now, the, before we get to the Equal Rights Act, because, again, that was in the 1970s, right? It mm -hmm. was passed. Yeah, the, you mentioned Margaret Chase Smith, which, which, which surprised me. So she was, the, she was the first, was she? She was the first. Well, there were other female senators, but they had all been their husband's uh, widows. That's interesting. Yeah. She was actually her husband's widow, too, but he'd been in the House. Yeah. And then she decided to, to run, run for the Senate 
as a person by herself. He was dead for a while there at that point, and um, and she won. She was the first one who did that. By, which surprised people, I think, that she was running on, on her own. But, yeah, yeah. It wasn't what you were supposed to do, but she, they were so used to her at that point yeah, in the, Maine that yeah. everything worked out fine. But it was it was for the country, and then she ran for president. Oh, my God, in heaven. You know? <laughs> well, but it, what it surprised me was that it, while she was in the Senate— she couldn't use the bath. The, the men had a bathroom, but she had to use a public bathroom. Yeah, this went on forever. I mean, if, if some, Barbara Mikulski, who just yeah. retired not sure. too long ago, but used to talk about that, about the fight they had to get a bathroom because they're just— And that was not just true there. In fact, I found as I wandered around the country talking to people, mm-hmm. if you went to any state legislature— uh-huh. And you wanted to talk to the women there. If you just brought up the bathroom <laughs> issue, instantly they would have all these stories— because female lawmakers nowhere had bathrooms. It was just not considered necessary. Well, I think that's a sign of the times. So, yeah, that, yeah, everybody uh, got a bathroom now. It's yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah, it's um, the the when you talk about the ERA, I mean, unlike the uh, unlike the initial um, uh, um, introduction of women's rights, uh, it, the sense I got was that there was a more concerted effort. To, I mean. Betty Friedan seems to me to come out as a hero in 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 your in your in your book, and and made someone and the and the National Organization of Women as a as a really impactful organization that changed things. So maybe yeah, and and you know as later on the uh, now became sort of the more conservative group, and you know mm-hmm. when other stuff was happening, but in the beginning they were the ones who went to court. Uh-huh. And that was the thing. You suddenly did have this law. You had a law saying women had the right to equal employment opportunities, but who who's going to get you that right? And yeah. women all over the country were able to call on the lawyers from now to come and support them and to get these laws changed. And that having lawyers was as be... always in this country very yeah. very important. And but it's interesting. Where where did the money for now come from? I don't uh, um, you know, just donations of donations, of, of, but sort of anticipating small scale private donations. Yeah, no, well, nobody expected it to be a large thing at yeah. the beginning, but then it just exploded. And you know, they had all the problems of growing that other things have. But uh, well, you know, there, in the context of this, uh, and it seems to me in lots of movements that that um, there's this question of whether government actually ever leads or just follows um, that. Uh, again, in the Vietnam War, and and I, I'm influenced. I was I took some classes from Chomsky when I was in, in graduate school at MIT, and and the notion that the last that in order to really have things change, they don't the government rarely initiates it. That government follows rather than leads. That it's that you have to have a movement of people, and and that forces government in some sense to act, whether it's a democracy or a dictatorship. In the in the sense of of the way that women's rights have changed over the last uh, that sort of fifty year period, do you see that as a as a that it was sort of always this so society was ahead of government, or were there times when government was ahead of society? When this happened, it happened so fast, fast, yeah, so incredibly fast because of the economy and because you did have this first generation mm-hmm. of post war young women who who had just grown up in a different kind of environment completely because of all the money because they yeah. could go to school because there wasn't that sense of nervousness about what was going on around them they were more optimistic they came of age and suddenly you every government in the country you could not stop any state legislature well, well there's someone that you could <laughs> or, the, or congress you know the, and Bella Ebsel kept saying i just can toss a bill in my god they're passing everything mm-hmm. that we give them now because they want to do a woman thing and there it is so any really in most states and cities and uh, in the federal government stuff was just flying out for a period there not no, all that long, but there was a period. What period? Well, this was in the seventies. Yeah. Now, um, was there demographic? T- I mean, when you say not everywhere, was there more resistance in one area? I mean, in the in the South, of course, there was more resistance. One thinks to civil rights, at least. Was there? Was it? Was it the same for women? Yeah, I mean, it's always you know the, the Southern states tended to be more conservative about all that stuff, and you know, there's famous stories about you know when suffrage passed. You know, yeah. Tennessee was the last state, yeah. and this. So everybody's sitting there, can Tennessee do it? Because everybody else was not going to do it. If Tennessee couldn't manage to come around, they'd never get the numbers. So, it, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, things were always more conservative in the southern states. Yeah, you know, there are times, it's funny now, because there are times when one sees in social movements now, and we'll maybe get to it, where the right, for some reason, seems to be ahead in certain er- in current times in certain areas, including at least 
proclaim discussions of free speech. But it, but but well, in a sense, the right, the, the well, at least Republicans were ahead in the sense of incorporating the women's women's rights in the Equal Rights Amendment, but their intent was to do it to kill, I mean, in terms of to kill well, civil rights. Well, that, that particular problem, actually it was Southern Democrats who liked mm-hmm. the idea mm-hmm. at the beginning of, mm-hmm. of sticking women in there because that they thought that was the best way to get rid of it. And at that time, the Republican Party was not the Republican Party that, that we tend to think of today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In terms of things like civil rights, um, even women's rights, they tended to be way ahead of the Democrats in many parts of the country. And it, it's just Margaret Chase Smith was a Republican. It, it's it, lots of Republican um, liberals out there, you know, doing doing great work. It's fascinating in the context of the current Republican Party to see that. And indeed, it's uh, it's too easy to, to to label that nowadays. I don't know if it'll be interesting to see if again in whether the pendulum swings in response to the current uh, extreme right-wing policies of many of the Republican Party, whether you might see a swing in there or a new party created. I don't know if you, uh, if... I'm not prepared to (laughs) (laughs) predict today how this is all going to work out. But it's, I mean, for our purposes right now, when you think of the Republican Party back in the the 1960s and 70s, it's not the same guys that you see there today. In the context of all this, uh, there's another quote I like in your book. You said, it's never been an era in America in which popular culture faced one direction for more than five minutes. <laughs> and so, well, you always want to change. Y- yeah, So, but no, but in this context, uh, you know, because part of this is change and then reaction to change and the attitude towards the change that's been happening and adjusting to change. In the context of women's rights, you want to maybe elaborate on that quote a little bit? Well, uh, and, and when we're, we're talking about the Equal Rights Amendment yeah. going through and sudden, everybody was passing it, they couldn't wait, and then suddenly... Right before, right before there was enough, there were enough states to vote to put in the Constitution. It came to a screeching halt with a movement that was not really about the Equal Rights Amendment. That was just about all the women who had been raised to believe that they had a certain role that was honored. The housewife, the glories of the housewife in the fifties and the sixties, on all TV programs, she was the heroine woman, yeah. and and that was what you wanted to be, and you were in all the magazines, there are pictures of you doing your yeah. cleaning and stuff. And that was the thing, and suddenly, almost it seemed like overnight, everybody is saying, you're a total failure, only a housewife. Yeah. Only a housewife, oh my Lord, what the heck is going on here? And there was there was a great, you know, response, a great kind of reaction against it, and it, it stopped the Equal Rights Amendment at that point in time. Interesting. But then there was also an equal reaction, which I think is continuing today, which is the sense that you talk about and that you were a failure if you couldn't do it all. Suddenly you had this opportunity to, new a whole new set of opportunities open to you that weren't before. But at the same time, and I think it's still current, I mean, uh, as far as I know, there's studies, the same thing, that in spite, women who work still do at least two thirds of the housework. Um, and at that time, of course, when these opportunities were open, there was uh, one thing that was really important you mentioned is is no child care. There was never, right. the, these opportunities were created without the infrastructure that could support those opportunities. And it's very interesting that even now we're just beginning to have a big national debate about early childhood education and whether families should simply have the right to quality early childhood ca- child care and ch- early childhood education which is the thing you need to call it, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It's not daycare. We want yeah, early, early childhood, childhood education yeah, for all. And that's the thing. And and it's, I think, going to be one of the big issues, uh, the big social issues that we're dealing with. Uh, if, if Certainly if a Democrat is elected, I can't think of anything that pushes right down to the core life patterns of so many people. Again, the United States is... Um well, frankly, is behind many other countries in terms of social, many social programs. And, and you know, I grew up in Canada, I've lived in Australia, and I was kind of shocked to discover uh, and, and complained about it. my university when my one of my, my executive assistant uh, got pregnant the first time, and I saw that she got something like three weeks yeah. paid leave, <laughs> and she could take, she could take another three weeks from, you know, f- mm. from her sick leave or something and use that up. Other countries provide six months or a year. It's a to- a, a, from the point of view of ensuring the ability of, of people to effectively carry on long-term careers, 
having three weeks, it just seems to me to be an automatic uh, non-starter. Well, everything about having children is not built into the system. I mean, it, in, in theory, it's great, but yeah, you, you and then people want to have it all. Yeah. And economically, women presume they're going to have to have the working part of it for a great part of their lives. Uh, but it it just there's that nobody has been willing to do that. There was a, a a couple of grand moments in Congress when it almost happened, and then just at the very last second, something fell apart and didn't happen. It's still a fact that women. Uh, I think it's still a fact that women tend to drop out of the workforce earlier. In fact, a lot. Of, I, I guess one of the things you talk about is that's becoming not just a a fact, but in some sense a. Um, a badge of honor that you that you choose to say I'm going to I'm going to go to law school I'm going to and I and I am pl- I'm planning to work for a few years and then have children and leave and 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 stop working full time. It's interesting that that's become a kind of um, for middle and upper classes at least according to your your, your discussion um, not something you do you resign yourself to but you look forward to. Well, sure. I mean. It- millions of people yeah. have given the opportunity to go home and spend time with their kids and mm-hmm. it, and if they knew they could do it without suffering severe economic repercussions and they could go back when the kids were older who I mean who would not want to spend some time with your kids well that's what I think and you, you mentioned men though but again I want to bring men in here so yeah. you w- do you think it's true that men would too and 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 no and people rarely talk about men being sort of at least from a from a social perspective as being something that's acceptable or looked up to for men to to say I'm going to be I'm going to take a career and I'm going to stop after a certain amount of time when I have kids. Well yeah, I mean you see it and if you see it probably it's made into a TV series. Or yeah, something, yeah, 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 yeah. It's certainly not nearly as common. Uh, yeah. And you know I I don't know if you know, women certainly still are more adjusted to the idea of, you know, childcare as being a rewarding, complete part of their lifestyle. But you see so many dads out there now, my God in heaven. I mean, when I was growing up, you never saw a dad out with their kids. But, yeah. but now it's everybody. I mean, it's just so normal. I can't, I mean, you know, there'll be another evolution. But the problem is always that with that evolution, somebody has to take some time away from their career to think about what's going to be happening with the kids and take care of the kids. And in some brilliant families, they both do it equally, but yeah, it's, it, generally it, it's somebody who's... Yeah, well, I think that well, the implicit point, if not explicit, is that it's great when when both, and I know a lot of families where both people take care of the kids equally and, and have to, both have two careers, but one still gets the sense, even that with that equality, it's not equal. Uh, I'll buy into that. Feel free. That's <laughs> yeah, no, that, that it's still the data shows that even in those yeah, families, yeah. that in terms of the other aspects of, of like cleaning, housework, uh, uh, that that still it, it works out not to be equal. Is that your well, data? Well, you know, the data has said that in the past. We'll see what it says in the future. Every year you've got a new bunch of people coming up with new thoughts and new plans. But certainly, and the big, the big thing, though, way more than who's sharing the responsibility mm-hmm. for married couples at home is that... So many women, soon I think it'll be most women who are mothers, don't have a spouse. They're single women raising these children. Maybe there's a guy yeah. you know, around someplace. But that, I mean, that the fact that women are now growing up and just having children and then just it's all their thing is, is new. It's pretty new as a grand cosmic well, scheme. Well, that was an interesting thing, too. A cla- of course, there's, there's, there's gender issues, there's class issues, there's, there's racial issues. But one of the things you point out is that it's a different. It's there's a different sort of trajectory that that at least for um, uh, middle and upper class women, it's 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 have children later, work and have children later. Whereas it's for for a lot of working class and lower lower class uh, individuals, it's have children first and then get married. And 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 maybe you want to talk about that too. What 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 are the forces that drive those differences? Well, they were study. I you know, I must admit, you know, it's been a while since I've last been down yeah, in the yeah. world of the studies of yeah. this this issue, but that they, this, it was partly a matter of women not really wanting to be stuck with some of these guys unless mm. they were really sure that they were the right. It wasn't simply a matter of men being irresponsible, which many, 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 many men were, yeah. but it was also a matter of women not wanting until there was a child to be stuck with 
having to choose one of these guys until they could see that the guy was a good provider, that the guy would share in all the responsibilities, that the guy would hang around, that the guy would not betray them. So that was a chess period that women bought into in many occasions as much as men did. Well, let me ask you, and it's not in the book, but sort of from an evolutionary perspective, from evolutionary psychology, it's not currently politically correct to necessarily argue that there are evolutionary distinctions but but the data seems to suggest at least that um, certainly in terms of mate selection, uh, attractiveness, that women have different criteria than men. And it's interesting, it causes great debate if you raise this up, especially in some college campuses now, whether, you know, to what extent things are biological or at least evolutionary and to what extent things, things are cultural. Well, clearly for many women, children are the priority. You want to make sure when you're of the age that mm -hmm. you... Will it be able to have children and that, that that's there for you? That that's a vision that many, 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 many women have of their lives, that there will be children. And so if you're having that vision, it makes sense maybe to think, well, that's the thing I've got to make sure I got done here, and then we'll deal with the man thing as it comes and goes. Do you think, it, and Matt, what do you think men think of? I don't know. That's your job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they think, but anyway, um, it's an interesting question whether, I mean, yeah, for a long time, it was, it was they thought about having male heirs, frankly, but I guess that's a, that's a, different, that's a different thing. That was a different era. Um, okay, so there's been a sea change, as you pointed out. So in the in the you know in the in this new millennia, um, it's starting 2000. You point out 50 percent of law and medical schools women, um, and there were uh, there were 40 percent even at, in sciences there were 40 percent of the women in undergraduates, and in a trend that continues, and I see at universities now, the majority of people at universities are young women, and by far it's in the high 50s. Low, now it's going up to the 60s. And that's a that's a sea change in in, in a in a real way. Um, has society changed quickly enough to adjust to that sea change? I'm not in charge of that problem. Right now. I know, you know, I know. Well, but you're a but you're a, but you write opinion pieces, so you can have a you can you can have I can a have viewpoint opinions about everything, yeah, yeah. but I don't always. Um, but you know, it's 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 it, it's it's a huge huge change, and it is true that 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 the society that we have developed right now. Um, particularly the middle class part of it, uh, has a, a routine and a, a ladder of success that, that seems to work better for women often than it does for men. Um, and it, everybody worries about, you know, young men and, and It's an interesting question. Uh, uh, it's interesting that this quota thing has come back in a different way. We, there was a quota originally sort of keeping women out mm -hmm. of medical school. There are quotas now that some people question. One of the ones that I've read about a lot lately is it happens in Canada where I grew up. Justin Trudeau has spoke openly about the women's equality need to do equal rights. And 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 he chose 50% of his cabinet to be women. 20% of the legislatures in the legislature were women at the time. And some people have said, well, that doesn't send a good message for women because it suggests that women are being chosen because they're women you know, it's the the cabinet is not representative of the led, of the people in in in, the, in who are have seats in parliament. How do you view that? It's um, it's I think a difference in the political system rather than than the picking of the cabinet system. The it's the way we elect people to office has always been a difficult route for women to take, partly because it involves so much effort and so much hanging around with people at night when, when you've got, you know, kids and other stuff to do. And it's just, and it's not, it's always a sideline. It's not, usually it's not your main source of income until you've moved quite a way up there. Yeah. And there's a lot of still organizations that work, you know, in the political atmosphere that are still kind of male dominated. And, uh, it, it, it's going to change. It's it's, not, it's, it's it, interesting it, that's going to change. I mean, you point out that you know even the the, the, the statistics in two thousand forty percent of women undergraduates in science, twenty percent in in positions. Some people would argue that that's a demonstration of of discrimination. Other people, I remember I was at the Nobel Prize ceremonies in two thousand and four, uh, and 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 there was one woman who was getting Nobel Prize at the time. And and interestingly enough, on stage, the head of the Nobel Prize said uh, the big presentation with the king said, look, you know, we recognize there's only one woman on stage, but Nobel Prizes are given for work that was 30, 40 years down the road. And so we are hoping that in 30, 40 years, because more women are coming into science, that you're going to see more more people, um, more women on stage, you know, more women getting the Nobel Prize. But that's going to come along. So 40% of undergraduates now, or at least in 2000, whereas 20% in 
in positions, in academic positions, may not be description. It may just be a representative of the fact that over time, you have to wait for those undergraduates to go to graduate school. Those, that, it, I have to say, in areas of science, science yeah. is very, very tough for women. I've known a lot of women scientists mm-hmm. who came up through the system and suffer. I mean, just... It was really tough, a lot tougher than a lot of other areas of, of you it know. It certainly was. I mean, one of my favorite examples, and I was thinking about this in your book, is Vera Rubin, a wonderful woman astronomer. Uh, I knew her. She, 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 I think I once I nominated her for the Nobel Prize. I know she was. She's deceased now. But she, she, her story is kind of amazing because she, she wanted to go to Princeton, but Princeton didn't take women. Mm-hmm. This is in the 60s or fi- late 50s or early 60s, and, and, and at least in PhDs in astronomy. She went to night school. She didn't know how to drive her 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 husband had to drive her and, and take her. And it, it was a series of one thing after another. Of course, she managed, you know, through determination, managed to make it through. It's an amazing story of a of a dedicated and 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 remarkable woman. And that there's that. But now the, how do you feel about quotas in general when it comes to the civil rights movement or or, or in terms of gender quotas in, in the workforce? Well people you don't need specific quotas to be aware that there are some places where women are thriving and some places where it's yeah. a lot more difficult. And obviously, you've got to figure that out. If you're a p- person who's in charge and you discover, you've, you're looking at your department and there are no women yeah, moving sure. up, there's a problem there. Um, it it, it it's, depends on what you're talking about. Well, the, I'm wondering as a woman, I mean, you were the first woman who was the Editor of the opinion pages, right? Can I tell you about that? Yeah, good. This is I was going to ask you about it. This so is good. a thing that I, when I go out and, yeah. and talk about women's stuff, that yeah. I like to talk about. There was a generation of women mm-hmm. who came right before me, mm-hmm. who went to court, who fought in this company too, who, who found that there was no pattern, there was no way forward, there were no women editors, there was no way a woman could move into the top, the most exciting, the sure. most profitable parts of the company. And they went to court, and they filed suits, and the company responded. But when the company responded, they were never the ones who got the reward, because oh. they were the pains in the neck who yeah. had gotten all the yeah. trouble. Yeah. It was people like me who were walking in the door right then, who had not pissed anybody off because uh. we were just in college, who got all those advantages. And there is a generation of women who, you know about the great leaders like Gloria Steinem and Betty yeah. Friedan, but there are all these women who nobody talks about, who just filed suits and who never got the stuff themselves, mm-hmm. and who filed suits for pensions. Mm-hmm. And the people coming into the workplace then got equal pension opportunities, but they never got their pensions. Yeah. It, it, it's, it happens all over the place. So it just, uh, you want every time you talk about this stuff to talk about these people mm-hmm. who opened up all the doors but never got to walk never through got them the benefits themselves. Of, yeah. and, and then, so you view yourself as a beneficiary. Of Absolutely. A, yeah, I, which I assume is, a, I mean, for many movement, for the civil rights movement, I suppose it's, it's I mean, Obama would say the same thing, right? I mean, it, 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 at least he said the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's useful if you're a person who, I mean, I I got to be editorial page editor in large part yeah. because of the people who were conceivably yeah. qualified to do it. I was the woman. Yeah. And they wanted think, that to happen. They wanted that to happen. Did that bother yeah. you? or was with, uh, No. And it, it doesn't, I mean, I, what, what bothers you is when you feel like, oh my God, nobody thinks I can do the job. Well, that's what thing, worries but me. No. If you say, when, you, when you're always referred to as the first editor of the editorial page, it, it, it doesn't, you know, that implicitly suggests for female editor of the editorial page that people are asking that question. I got to tell you, when when uh, this came up, Hal Raines, who was the editor before yeah. me, who was yeah. moving downstairs to become the executive editor, came in to see me and said, we've talked about this and we think that you should take my job. And I was not really in the line for it. And I was a columnist. I was really yeah. enjoying that. Yeah. And I said, Gee, how I remember I, thinking how, yeah. how sad I was that you were leaving as a columnist. I that. was sad too. And I said, Hal, I don't know. And he said... Look at it this way. Look at where you are in the course of the history of the world. There are not many first women jobs left out there. And unless you think you're going to be baseball commissioner, this is the one you take to be the first woman to do something. Uh And I thought, yeah, that's cool. I could be the first woman. So that, that was an argument for me. Okay, well, look, let's, you know, I want to switch the story, switch the direction a little bit about, I mean, I must say, partly in your columns, but also in this book, that, that another person who, 
view you view to some extent as a beneficiary, but I get the sense of immense respect for Hillary Clinton and what she, you know, in a time when she was, you know, running president and has was vilified by many. I mean, not just being the first. Actually, that book was written before she was she was a candidate, right. uh, but before she got the nomination, which was which happened after that book. Hillary Clinton, tell me, tell me about it. just to stick it out and have such a messy history, mm-hmm. which had to do in part with just being the first woman at mm-hmm. this and that this, mm-hmm. and also trying to have a, a career when her husband had this career. Mm-hmm. All the stuff that went into her life, part of which is the exact history of the mm. women's movement, mm. part of which is totally peculiar to the mm. Clintons and what they did. She stuck it out. She st- strode on forward. And whatever else you think about what she did, and now there's mm. this very popular side, oh, my God, she's a terrible candidate. Yeah. Rah, rah, rah. She made it normal. And the person who makes Man. stuff normal, and this country gets is very adaptable. And yeah. once you get used to something... It's fine. I yeah. remember the first time when Katie Couric became the first yeah. on-air anchor at night, and everyone was going crazy. crazy. It was such a big deal. And 10 minutes later, Diane Sawyer became <laughs> the second one. And it was like, well, yeah, of course, okay, it's yeah. what we do. Here it is. And now nobody would ever, no human being would ever think, is that a man or a woman sitting there giving us the news at night? It's just Americans are very adaptable. And now you're seeing it this year. You've got 200 million women thinking about running for president. Yeah. And we'll spend this whole next period, looking and saying, oh, wait a minute, you're doing this here. Are you considering the women too? And how are you treating them? Is it the same all the way along the line? It's going to be very subtle and very strange. And we're going to do another thing. And we're going to get used to another Another, thing. And within, you know, 10 years, it just, you know, it meant women, whoever, you know, it'll it'll be be something new that we're worried about. (laughs) It's amazing how how fast that switch can happen. And again, I think, I tend to think it's young people. I mean, in this case, if I think of of, uh, um, same-sex marriage, I mean, it was just sort of uh, 20 years ago, it would have seemed impossible. And then Mm -hmm. when I talked to young women in my daughter's generation, it was obvious that they didn't see any issue there. And Mm -hmm. it was obvious to me, therefore, that that the change was going to happen because they didn't see it. It was just like... It, <laughs> you know, when Hillary Clinton became a senator, and there was a big, huge deal about that at the time, and my my, my niece was then, you know, just a little kid, and she, uh, my, my sister said she's watching all these programs about, you know, Hillary Clinton, and she turned to my mother and said, can a man be a senator? And, and <laughs> she was eight, but at yeah. that point in her life, she was not really aware Where? that that was a job that you wouldn't naturally have this woman doing. So it, it, it moves fast. It's all good. Well, and I guess you might say, well, sorry, she's not going to be unheralded, but Hillary Clinton didn't get the benefits, but I, one might say that, that, that... Well, she got some benefits. She got a lot of benefits <laughs> out of it, I guess. But, well, let's talk about... Ben, I want to talk about you now in a different way. I, I mean, from being... Uh, why did you go back to... The, uh, uh, so you, you had this position. You went back to be a columnist. What, was, yeah. was it a... What, why? Um, it was my decision. I did it for five years, mm-hmm. and it was a great adventure. I mean, oh my God, nine eleven happened like yeah. the day I became the editor. It was, it was, and and I learned so much, and I watched this place operate. Yeah, and I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to work for the New York Times. It's just the greatest I, institution I imagine, in the universe. Yeah. I have, and and so I had all these great things happen, but I never in my life ever kind of imagined that my goal was going to be. I was always a writer. So once I did it for three years, uh, no, five years, um, I took, went out to dinner with Arthur Sulzberger, and I said, you know, it's been a great five years, but I think now, you know, let somebody else do what I want to write. And he said, never in the history of this paper has anyone voluntarily given up a position of power. <laughs> this doesn't happen. And he's, but, you know, whatever you want to do. So, um well, you know, I guess, I except for the continual pressure, and I know when I've written you periodically, you say, now's not a good day because my columns <laughs> do. But uh, uh, I just think an, a columnist must is like the ideal position in a way. Oh, it's the best job in the world. To yeah. be a columnist for the New York Times is definitely the best job in the world. Yeah. Absolutely. No question about it. Yeah, you, you could, yeah, you get <laughs> to say what, more or less, as far as I can tell, whatever you want. Oh, yeah. Nobody, you know, 
reads you or goes over you or says, oh my God, what are you doing tonight? It just, you just stick it in and there it goes. Yeah, it's interesting to see that. And it, well, it's interesting to see, to, for me to see sometimes, therefore, how two columnists can be saying the same things because they don't, I mean, and you don't it's know. because it's it's a common, it's things people are thinking about. It's, it's kind of interesting when that happens because you see it's some, a current idea that is certainly, there's an undercurrent in a lot of people's thinking. Yeah, there have been many meetings over the years about how can we make sure there's a diverse, you know, Topics yeah. every day, and it you know it's I you know it, the point is that you can ensure well when it comes to diversity of of gender or racial I mean I think the the, the idea is that is that you want to the best ideas to the best people to be able to do their thing and just let them go and I think there's a lot of value in that uh, in terms of um, of encouraging excellence I guess generally mm-hmm. and 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 hopefully I mean do you see that as a, I mean the ideal being ultimately a world which is Racial blind, gender blind, the point is you're just, it's not an issue that people think about. They think about what people are saying rather than who they are. Yeah, and but we'll think of some new thing. <laughs> yeah, we'll think of some new way to, to, to label people in a way that makes... Now, the interesting thing is we spent a lot of this time talking about, partly because I've been reading your book and, 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 and fascinated by it, but in terms of your personal interests and what you write about as a columnist, what, what things interest you most? Um, well, in terms of policy and things like that, and issues like early childhood education, you know, reproductive rights, there's gun issues, there's lots of stuff. But my, if I had a mission going through forever, mm-hmm. it was sort of to try to make people interested in this stuff without making them want to throw themselves out the window, uh-huh. you know, just to try to have a way of looking at stuff that made you committed to it, interested in it and everything else, but not suicidal. So what I like, because I humor is important to me, there is most most times an element of humor, which is the sort of the absurdity of life rather than the, the dismal nature of life. So absurd versus dismal, I guess. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, If you start out working with the New York City Council, you have to yeah. work on <laughs> how can we make people not want to kill themselves when they read this story? <laughs> well, in the current times, it's a, a well, challenge there's that, that. too, yeah. Yeah. Now, so if I were to pick, say, presidential politics, religion, Women's issues, science, climate change. If you, you know, when you think about, it, if you were presented with all those and you had to write a column tomorrow, which one, a priori, based on your, on your sort of personal predilections, maybe it's a, it's a property of the time of the day, or what, what intrinsically is your biases? Which would you pick? It's all those things. I mean, I, I, I do politics mostly, so the, you know, the, the next generation of young Democrats coming up is really fascinating right now. Donald Trump, I've, you know, had relationships with since the 1990s, for God's sake. And so that's always a Yeah, it's, it's a two-way interest. thing. He thinks so highly of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm a dog and a liar. That was what he wrote on my column one day. That wasn't it. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, it's well, that's, a, I'm sure, will be a badge of honor. You, you weren't a member of, of Nixon's uh, a hit list, but you, but you at least certainly been. No, and I was telling somebody the other day when I was in in Connecticut. Somebody said to me, "The great thing about our job as reporters is the governor knows my name," mm-hmm. and it was such a big deal. And I said to somebody the other day, "The president knows my name," and he called me a moron in a capital meeting. So, well, you know, but on the other hand, I worry. To me, the major hope of democracy is a, is a free press, and I've been disappointed tremendously over the years and at times in journalism and during the Iraq War. I was disappointed, frankly, in the New York Times, in in the sense of uh, not openly saying this is this is just nonsense. This is this is this, there's the president's lying. They, 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 uh, there's no evidence for. In any case, I've been worried about, especially in this time of celebrity, where journalists become celebrities, especially television journalists, whether there's a hesitancy to then do the job of confronting, because if you know you confront the politicians, you know you lose access. If you have a cozy relationship with them, particularly Fox News right now with 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 with, with uh, Trump, if if you if you actually then say, hey, this is re- reality, and it embarrasses the politician, you suddenly lose access. Do you want to come in on that? I'm, I've been disturbed about that. Oh, it depends on who you're talking to and what the problem is. But I can only tell you really about the the shop here, mm-hmm. and there's a great desire to have diverse opinions and show all the different yeah. sides. Sometimes it's really tough. It's really tough with this administration mm-hmm. often to yeah. come up with these great news moments that yeah. we talk about, you know, this is on this hand and on the other hand, because very weird stuff is happening right now. But um, it, it's the, the desire 
to be fair and impar- impartial and reasoned about everything except what we call the core positions, which mm-hmm. you know are things like we we, we believe in in racial and gender mm-hmm. equality and um, free markets and and trade, lots of whole different things. And we're 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 liberals, and we tend toward the tax and spend end of mm-hmm. things as well, but. Um, Within the, that core, everybody wants everything to be known and everything to be talked about. Well, uh, Noam Chomsky said that the, that Trump has played the press. I mean, that we re, we just constantly hear about uh, Trump can say something and do something that's outrageous and constantly be in the news, and it distracts from the real news, the important issues, and the and the press just seem to buy into it. Yeah. That's true, but I've been doing this a long time. Yeah, <laughs> no matter yeah. what's happening, there are many people who will say you're paying way too much attention to this thing here. But you've been on TV. You had, a, in fact, in Connecticut, I think you had a maybe a TV, a maybe. little bit, and sometimes there. a PBS. Yeah. There's a difference between print journalism and 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 television journalism. Yeah. One gets a sense that television journalism is, well, is more. F- fixated on news of the moment and maybe celebrity than print journalism and that print journalists are a little freer. Do you want to, do you get that sense at all? Or yeah, no? but you know, my, my, you're right. But my, my goal in life is not to have a fight about, you know, there's so many yeah. hardworking people working in the electronic media that I'm not going to have a fight about who's doing more work or Speaking what. Speaking of print journalism, a lot of people said it's dead. Did, haven't you gotten the news? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just it's a new place. I mean, it, it, my God, look at look at the web. I and mean, what what do you do on the web? You type things, and you you know, yeah. it's not. Well, it, yeah, but here's the problem. Then I mean, it's the web has changed things. So it used to be that the for many people on the left, say the New York Times would would, would get be the source of their news, and and the Wall Street Journal maybe a little bit on the right or. In the old days, when there were three television programs, ABC, NBC, CBS, and then the web came out, and people like me thought, great, this means uncensored news. But what it also means is uncensored fabrication. And and how do you see this issue, this famous fake news issue? It's a long, obviously. This is a big, very, very long conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we, you know, I know, and we could spend an hour on it. Yes, we're not going to. But, yeah. but, but what worries you most? Oh, there's so many things that worry me in the world yeah, right yeah. now. Climate change worries me right more, now. More than fake news? More than fake news. Okay, well, that's interesting. But the reason I wanted to end with it is that, as I say, I find your what you said, you motivate people to not want to jump out the window. And the absurdity of life, to me, always, I, I think maybe it was Catch-22 when I was a young person, that made me realize that it's the absurdity of life that, of course, if you look at life as absurd instead of dismal, then then... A sense of humor helps you get through at least the fact that maybe this too shall change, or maybe only by seeing that it's absurd can we change it. I'll buy into that. Well, I, I'll <laughs> buy into it because one of the things that I think you do so well and I appreciate so much is to point out those absurdities that get us thinking about things that we may think are normal that shouldn't be normal. And I want to thank you for doing that. Well, thank and you I, for having and, me. And I encourage you to continue doing that for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Origins Podcast is produced by Lawrence Krauss, Nancy Dahl, Amelia Huggins, John and Don Edwards, and Rob Zepps. Directed and edited by Gus and Luke Holwerda. Audio by Thomas Amison. Web design by Redmond Media Lab. Animation by Tomahawk Visual Effects. And music by Rickolis. To see the full video of this podcast, as well as other bonus content, visit us at patreon.com slash originspodcast.